are getting real. Jesus, take the wheel. Only way I'm getting to the other side. Days are getting dark. Life's a little hard. Blinded, but I'm trying not to lose sight. I don't got this. I know you got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll believe it before I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're going to see me through it. If anybody can, you can do it. God, I know in the trial and the pain, fire and the rain, you're going to see me through it. You're going to see me through it. If anybody can, you can do it. And whenever my hope runs away, you say the day you're going to see me through it. When the sky falls. Who am I gonna call? The one who put it up there in the first place. Full scale attack, devil on my back, better lace him up and go put on my game face. I don't got this, I know you got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe it before I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're gonna see me through it. If anybody can, you can do it. God, I know in the trial. Good morning, church. Let's stand together. For centuries, the church has been practicing a custom that encourages our hearts, and it goes like this. If you greeted somebody who was a believer on the street, you would say, he is risen, and that person would respond, he is risen indeed. Yeah, exactly. Roman, the Roman cross was very efficient at killing. And to see Jesus hanging there and then put in a tomb, lifeless, it just caused so much doubt that he could have recovered from that. But over 500 people saw him walking around post-tomb. So we say, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And we will sing those praises.
All the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing. Yeah. All the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing. All the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing to you. crazy story. You can tell all your friends, somebody walked out of the tomb after being murdered and they just will look at you like, really? There's people that have not heard that story today. It's a great story because it's Jesus' story and he is saving people in that story. Amen? He is risen. Oh, come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Face the Find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in him will live forever So bring all your failures, bring your addictions Come lay them down at 
is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's read these words together as we confess. Then we'll sit for a minute and then we'll return to singing worship. Gracious Father, you sent your Son to die and rise to new life in order that death might be brought to an end and that we might live a new life in him. Yet we confess that we too often have chosen to remain captive to doubt and fear and ways that lead to death. By our thoughts, words, and actions, we have scorned your love, diminished the lives of others, and defaced your image in us. Father, forgive us for Jesus' sake and enable us by his resurrection power to live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us. Amen. You may sit and let's talk to Jesus and then we'll respond. Church, the work of the cross is finished. We are clean. The Bible teaches us that as we are faithful to confess, he, Jesus, is faithful to wash us clean. Let's stand and sing the gospel together.
in robes of white the blazing sun he shall pierce and I will other. You can practice that as we turn and greet one another. He is risen. Good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. Thank you for the three of you. If I can ask you guys to make your way back to your seats, um, that'd be great. Would you join me as we pray and just give thanks to the Lord this morning? You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created that you pleased. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. 
Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings, and they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshiped God. They sang, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you are the one who knows. And he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. King of the universe, we bless you. We can rejoice because you chose to suffer and die. Forgive us for making light of what our freedom cost. We speak directly to you because you tore the veil in two. Forgive us for not seeking you in each moment. We cling tightly to our safety and comfort, forgetting and denying that you have called us to live bolder and braver lives. Show us the way today and always. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power and strength belong to our God, the King on the throne, who is risen from the dead. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our preparation to receive the word. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and Good morning, Long Beach Alliance. It is good to be with you on this wet and rainy Easter morning. Thank you for fighting through the the biggest storm of 2024 to uh, suffer and and, and be here this morning. Uh, I am am here to celebrate with you and, and cry out, He is risen. Good, good. Christians everywhere are saying that phrase all around the world today and, and really every day as we celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, this morning, we are going to be flying through numerous verses 
that are all written down in your outline that says he is risen indeed. You're going to want to have that in order to track through where we're going this morning because we will be moving quickly and I am not going to even attempt to read all of the verses that are written down, just so you can relax a little bit, thinking, oh, I should probably postpone lunch till two. Um, I will not do that to you, I promise, uh, but we will be moving fairly quickly uh, from, from verse to verse to verse, and so this morning, uh, with that in mind, and in honor of God's word, would you please stand? I am going to be reading from Hebrews, I will also be reading from First Peter, uh, and yes, I think we'll go uh, from Hebrews 1.1 into First Peter chapter 1, and it will all be up on the screen, so you can follow along if you would like to, and if you have a Bible, these are going to be verses that are in your outline. Here is our story from the Lord's mouth to your heart this morning. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 2.10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2.17, therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters that pertain to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people. And the explosion of 1 Peter 1.3, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You should read that verse numerous times. It is rich. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times. For the sake of you, who, through him, are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. This is God's word for you this morning. From his mouth to your heart, you may be seated. Sometimes you read verses in the Bible and they're they're so dense and they're so packed with... uh, with information that it's just easy to glaze over them. And so I want to, I want to give a little bit of form to, to what we're talking about when it comes to the death of, on Good Friday and the resurrection that we celebrate this morning of Jesus Christ. Um, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, uh, from the days of, of Moses, uh, God had Israel build a temple. Uh, from the time of Moses and Israel wandering to the time of Christ, about 1,500 years, the high priests, when you hear the word priest, you should think in your head, intermediary. Someone who stands in between two people and brings them together by virtue of of relationship. In other words, they, they have a relationship with this party, they have a relationship with that party, and they bring the two parties 
together. It's why we call government officials ministers, because they're bringing together what the government provides and what the people need, and, and they bring them together in, in, in their person. In the same way, the high priest stood between God, whom they had a relationship with, and the people who had a relationship with God at a greater distance. And, and he represented the people to God, and he represented God to the people, and the high priests were the intermediaries that stood between mankind, the people of God, and God himself. So when you hear that word, don't be freaked out and think, oh my gosh, I don't know what they're talking about. That's all that it means. It means intermediary, uh, the the, the, the priest that stood in between God and the people he would enter into, the very high priest, would enter into the inner chamber chamber of the temple. Now, I want you to watch, look at this first slide. In the Holy Land, Melinda and I went and visited this place six, six or seven years ago. Um, in the Holy Land, uh, they have a, this is a, uh, a model that is built. It's, it's, it's a, at a place called the Holy Land Motel. Um, and it's a model of Jerusalem from the time of Christ. Now, I know some of you um, are not super familiar with Jerusalem because modern day it has the Dome of the Rock, the, the Islamic Temple, um, uh, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it, that's at the top of it. That area that you see that big square area on the left of the slide, that is the temple complex with both of the courtyards, the courtyard of the Gentiles, the courtyard of the women, uh, the courtyard of the Jews, um, all of the courtyards are right there, and then the temple complex. Now, zooming in just a little bit more on that, this is the temple complex. You would go through, only God's people could walk into the temple complex, and then when you entered in, further in, uh, to the temple complex, it would be a place where the, the, the priests... All of the priests were giving sacrifice. And once a year, on the very interior of that temple, the high priest would make an offering for all the people, for himself and then all of the people, that was called the Day of Atonement. Now, if we zoom in to that, we're going to go to illustrations now. There you go. So this is the temple complex. You see those two great pillars? They would go up the steps. And they would go inside, and, and this is on your outline, actually. It's just so microscopic that I felt like I needed to put it on the screen. Like once I printed it, I'm like, oh, that's such a nice picture, and I can't tell what anything is. Um, and so I wanted to be up on the screen. I want you to see when it, when it talks about the priests going in to make intercession, when it talks about the priests going in to, to make an offering, this is what they did. They walked inside, and this was the interior. You can see where the pillars are, right? It's just kind of a shrinky-dink. Um, and and then on the very inside, do you see those, those big winged animals right there? They, 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 look, they look kind of like just giant winged beasts. Um, you might even remember this for those of you that are um, not, you know, if you're under the age of 20, you should watch this movie. But Raiders of the Lost Ark um, had a great depiction of the Ark of the Covenant, right? And if you remember that, and it was, it was two giant wings that were bent over, and those are supposed to be angels that are bending over their wings and creating a seat, as though it's a seat that you can sit on. And so the altar had four points on the outside, four big kind of horns that stuck out, and it had these wings of the angels that flowed right across the top of it, and this is that kind of a picture. Now, I, I just want to give that to you so that you can understand what it required for people to experience forgiveness as God was introducing or revealing himself to the people. That one special day, Hebrews chapter 9, says that on that one special day that they call the Day of Atonement, you might recognize it as one of those things that's on your count. Do you ever hit your your iPhone calendar, or for those of you that are um, poor Android users, um, you guys too, uh, you go on your calendar and then and, and you see some some holiday, and you're like, I have no idea <laughs> what that is. Maybe it, maybe it's holy, maybe it's you know whatever um, Ramadan, uh, and and much of the world looks down at Yom Kippur, and they have no idea what Yom Kippur is or what that means, and, and it means Yom Day Kippur Atonement, Day of Atonement, Day of Payment, uh, day, day of Atonement, the most important day of the year, like Easter is for, for you and I, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was the most important day for the Jews because they knew on that day the high priest was going to go into the interior 
of the Holy of Holies, the only day of the entire year that he did this. And he was going to make a sacrifice, first for his own sins, to make sure that he was clean, and then for the sins of the people. And you know what it, you know what it says? He made sacrifice for all of the unintentional sins that they didn't even know about. How about that? Like there, there are things that you and I do that, that are sins against God, and we don't even know about it. We don't even realize it. But God, because of his great mercy toward us, provided a way that we could experience forgiveness. On the Day of Atonement, the second page that you've got there, the high priest. Now, look at how the high priest normally dressed. This is really fancy schmancy. Um, this is like, I'm dressed nicer than I ever do during, during the year. I'm wearing a coat and a shirt, which is amazing for me, uh, just so you know. Uh, but th- look at this. I mean, he had precious stones that were on a breastplate that hung over his neck and, and this giant robe that he wore, and there were tassels on it. And it was really fancy. And do you see him applying blood to the corner of the altar? That's what I was talking about. There were little horns there, and, and they were told to make a sacrifice and, 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 and to do it in a very specific way. And so this is a picture of the high priest doing that on, on, a, regular, on a regular altar. But on the Day of Atonement, on the Day of Atonement, the priest dressed very differently. Look at this. Thank you. He dressed very, very differently. He dressed extremely plain. In fact, more plain than at any other time of the year. Because he was going into the place where God had placed the testimony. There were, there were things inside of the Ark of the Covenant that were a testimony of God's goodness to his people. And so it was called the Ark of Testimony or the Ark of Promise or what we call the Ark of the Covenant. And inside of that Ark were, were special objects and so it represented this, this place that, that showed how much God loved his people and how much he wanted to be in relationship with them. And that seat that was there, that was created by the angels that were um, made out of uh, olive wood and then then I believe covered in gold. I think that's right. Um, And and they, they were covered in gold and it was spectacular. That seat in the mind of the Jewish people, in the mind of God's people, was the place where God would come to sit down and have fellowship with his people. And the high priest, after purifying himself, would dress very, very plainly. Why? Because you don't bring anything to God. You don't bring all your fancy schmancy stuff to God. You don't bring your awesome Tesla. You don't bring your fantastic clothing. You don't bring your brand new stinking iPhone. The stuff that fills our our lives and our concerns, when the high priest came in on that day, he wore the most plain outfit that you could imagine. And it was so terrifying to be anywhere near the presence of God that they would fill the entire chamber up with, with incense and smoke. It was, it was hidden, in fact, behind a curtain, and not the kind of curtain that you might have in your house. I don't know if people still have curtains, but it's not that kind of a curtain. It was a curtain that was about three feet thick, and, and it, it was like numerous linen curtains that were all pressed in against each other, and, and the, the high priest carrying blood and carrying incense, would have to weave himself, kind of push himself through this giant curtain to go into the place where he would make the sacrifice for himself and for the people. He came in in humility. He couldn't look upon the altar because it would cause his death, it says in the scriptures. And so it was, there was smoke there so that he could kind of almost blindly prod his way in and do what he was supposed to do in great humility, stripped of all self-honor. He was simply a humble servant. It's a picture of what we bring to the table when it comes to receiving salvation from God. We don't come because of our own deeds or works or good actions. That's not even remotely close to what saves us. We come simply 
into the presence of God by the grace of God. Because he's merciful and because he loves us. The high priest would make these offerings. uh, And on that day, the people would be forgiven, but only for a year. And so they'd make their regular offerings during the year. And then Yom Kippur would come again and the high priest would do this again. And it repeated and repeated and repeated. I have details on all of the all of the movement that goes on, and probably the most important part is the, the high priest protected from gazing upon that, that, that seat where God sat. He would sprinkle blood on the seat. And the blood, it said in Leviticus 17.11 that God gave them the blood of animals to temporarily cover their sins, to pay for their sins. Remember what he said to Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree, on that day you will surely die. And spiritually, that's exactly what happened to them. They died and suddenly were separated. And that separation is passed on to all mankind. All of us live the uh, beginning of our lives separated from God. Selfish basically, in nature. And that selfishness comes out in a thousand different ways. We sang about some of them this morning. I felt the the deep sense of compassion over, I believe, many of the lives that are in this room this morning. Bring your addictions. Bring your shortcomings. Come just as you are. You don't come dressed up fancy You come stripped of all of that to come into the presence of God. He would sprinkle that blood. That blood covered their sin. The the seat that was created by the angels is called the seat of atonement. It was the place where God accepted the sacrifice and was able to have a good relationship with his people. What seems like to us ridiculous, you know, got to do all this stuff, and you got to make all these movements, and you got to be careful about this, and you're burning incense, and you're killing animals, and you're, but, you know, putting blood on things. What seems so bizarre to us in the 21st century was a huge blessing to the people of Israel. Because it was by by this very, very dramatic illustration that they got to experience forgiveness and relationship with God. Sometimes we we poo-poo all of the information that's provided to us about sacrifice in the Old Testament. And we just think, well, we don't have to do that stuff anymore, so it's not that important for me to know. But I want you to know that every single aspect, every single movement, every single thing that the the high priest was doing was just a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would accomplish when he came to earth. It was all a foreshadowing so that the people could see Do you remember how we've always done this? Do you remember how you grew up always knowing about sacrifice? Do you remember how we had to do it every year, how we had to make regular sacrifices, how we we were just kind of stuck in this difficult system of having a relationship with God? Do you remember all of that? Now look to the Messiah. Look to Jesus and look at how he accomplishes all of it. One of the most vivid parts of the Day of Atonement was after the blood was sacrificed on the mercy seat, the high priest would repeat the same procedure with the sacrifice for the people. And then a goat, two goats actually, one goat that was sacrificed for the sins of the people and another goat that they placed blood on his head and then, and then they released him out into the wild. This is letter H, by the way, on that section next to the picture of uh, the big gate leading into the city. This goat was escorted into the wilderness as a payment for sin. Um, And it is where we get the phrase scapegoat. It's where we get the phrase, like that's what it was. It was the, this goat 
bore the sins of the people, and those sins were taken away, taken away, out of the city, gone. And as that goat just walked off, so the people also had a visual, right, illustration, a visual experience of God providing a way for their sins to be taken away so that they could have a good relationship with God, and they were grateful. I know some of us, like me actually, our sensibilities about like sacrificing animals, like raising lambs and goats and bulls and then chopping them into pieces and tearing out their guts and and burning and, and, and all of the different things that you had to do. Like our modern day sensibilities are like, that is so disgusting. I would never do something like that. I love animals. I want to hug my goat, not, not chop it into pieces. You know what I mean? Like it's, I, 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 watch, I watch videos of baby goats, you know, getting surprised and falling down. That's way more fun than chopping them up and, and, and that kind of stuff, right? And so I, I get it. I get that we live, you know, thousands of years after these events happen, but I don't, it's so important to me as a pastor and as a leader, that you don't miss how Jesus, from the very beginning of the story, like actually before the beginning of the story, the whole story is really about Jesus. It's really pointing to the Messiah. It's really pointing to what God has provided. And he does all that stuff in the Old Testament to give living illustrations of what salvation is going to be like. And then... Jesus comes, last page, number three. All of those vivid sacrifices were foreshadowing of that future Messiah. We read Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 at the beginning of my, my time. And it says, long ago, in, in, during ancient days, in many ways and through many methods, God spoke to his people. And he used to speak to them through the prophets. But in this modern day, he now speaks to them through Jesus. And in the original language, it actually says Jesus as though he is a language of God. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't say he spoke through, uh, through the Messiah or through Jesus as a prayer. It says, in ancient days, God spoke through prophets, and, and that's how he communicated. And now he speaks Jesus. If you were to just read it literally, that's what it says. And now he is speaking Jesus. Jesus is the living word of God. And he came to literally reveal God to all of humankind. He is the mouthpiece, the the manifestation, the physical reality of God in a body living as a man. Jesus, this Jesus came to provide an atonement for sin, a payment for sin, a, a blood sacrifice for sin. It says in 1 John 2, 2, he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not ours only, but for those of the whole world. Do you see what that says? The blood, get it back up there. Don't take it down. Thank you. The blood of Jesus pays for sins, and not just yours, but for the sin. It's sufficient for the sins of the whole world. In other words, God, God gave you Jesus, says He caused you to be born again. He gives you Jesus and He covers you, like sprinkling on the Atonement, see, he covers you in the blood of Jesus Christ so that your sins are taken away. And he has not done it just for you, but he's also done it for others. And it's sufficient for the sins of everybody in the entire world. Like he gave it to you to give away to others, in other words. You were not just spritzed with blood the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the perfect one, so that you could just hold on to it and say, woohoo! Like Willy Wonka, I got a ticket into the factory. I got the blood, and I got my ticket to get into heaven. Fantastic. I'm just going to keep this for myself. 
No, it says it's sufficient for everyone. It's meant to be given away. Because even though it's, even though it's sufficient for the sins of everyone in the world, it's only efficient in the lives of those who believe. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Nobody. Not Abraham, not Isaac, not Jacob, not Moses, not Joseph, not David, not anybody. They all had to have faith in the Messiah. And the Messiah has been revealed in Jesus Christ. And his closest followers made it clear in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. Sin separates us, but Jesus, as a great high priest, brings us, the people, together with God. So many people I listen to are working, working, working so hard to be good neighbors and good people and, and upright citizens. And you know, there's, I mean, there's obviously nothing wrong with that. But they come to God and they want to present a, a, a cleaned up life. And God is not interested in all your baubles and all the things that you bring to the table. He's the God of the universe. Did you hear the prayer from Diana this morning? It's beyond our comprehension. How great and how mighty and how pure and holy and how just awesome God is. Jesus provides it all. He provides everything that you and I need. This great offer of salvation, of course, did not come cheap. It required the life of the perfect one. The lamb that was slain in the Old Testament was representative of an unblemished animal whose sin covered whose blood covered our, our sin. But now Jesus comes and lives a perfect human life in perfect relationship with God. And he goes to the cross by choice so that he can make payment for sin. Did you hear that when I was reading out of 1 Peter? I'm going to read it again later. But it says that he went and made purification for sin and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He made purification on your behalf. Purification that you can obtain in your life by trusting in Jesus, by having faith in what he has done in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. It's not cheap, letter C of number three. Just as God had designed it, just as it has always been, life costs life. Blood for blood. His blood for your blood. In order for Jesus to save us, he had to die for us, to make the payment for sin which we could not. Once and for all, Jesus was the perfect one sacrifice for sins for all time. In other words, the blood of goats and bulls simply covered our sin temporarily. The blood of Jesus covers your sin permanently. Once and for all, no need for any more sacrifices. The temple would be torn down just 70 years later, after the time of Christ, and has never made sacrifice again in that location. Never once again. God has made sure that it is clear that Jesus was the final and only sacrifice needed, and that by his blood, it pays for sin and Romans 6.23, it pays for the penalty of sin, which is death. It's why the resurrection is so important. If he doesn't come back from the dead, then all that stuff that he said, all that stuff that he did doesn't matter. But if God raises him from the dead, it means that the sacrifice is accepted. It means that everything that he said is true. It means that he rises above the penalty of sin, which is death, and he offers eternal 
life. This is extraordinary news. He made the perfect payment. He is the ultimate scapegoat. And he carries away our sin. When Christ died, it says that the veil that is in the temple, a three or four foot thick veil, right, that separated the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was from the center court where all the people were, this veil was torn in two. And not from, by human hands from the bottom to the top. It was torn in two from the top to the bottom. An image of God just going, Whing! And just splitting that curtain that separated God from the people and only allowed for the high priest to stand in between. That curtain was torn asunder, torn in two, top to bottom, from heaven to earth. The separation between God and man has been abolished. Now, we can approach God boldly, the Word of God says, because of a relationship with God through God the Son, Jesus Christ. It's all sealed by God the Holy Spirit, who is given to us so that we might be disciples, be, be truly devoted to what matters, not just in this life, but in this life and the next. Easter, today that we celebrate Easter, is the moment that all of this goes public. It's the moment when everything comes together. All of, the, all of the unknowns of the disciple, all of the, the, the foolishness that they had kind of, that's kind of described in the Gospels, all of the, all of the wickedness that, that they had, it all, it all just kind of ceases when, when Jesus is resurrected from the dead. When he comes back, all of the stories that he's been telling, all of the stuff that he's been talking about suddenly comes together in their minds and hearts. And now... Now they know. And to make sure they know, Jesus even appears to them. Remember Thomas? I'm not going to believe until I touch the holes in his hands and the, the spear hole that was in his side. And Jesus shows up and he's like, Thomas, come on over. I mean, that was a moment, right? What does it say to us? Bring your sin. Bring your doubts. Bring all of the things that you've been aiming at in this life that just require more, more, and more. Bring all that ambition and all that stuff and bring it, bring it to Jesus and lay it at his feet. Don't be controlled. Don't be, don't be living for the things of this world. Rather, Jesus has come and he has made the payment. It says that he, he has made the payment on the altar. Even the temple, was, the, the temple that was in Jerusalem was a, a foreshadowing of, of the temple in heaven. It says that Jesus walked into the temple in heaven. He went right into the holiest place and he made sacrifice for sins and he covered it with his blood. And that blood is effective for all of eternity. Easter, as it rolls into our lives, is the moment when it all is shown to be true. While the death of Jesus conquers sin and its penalty, death, Romans chapter 8, it is the resurrection that gives us confidence in what Jesus said, what he did, what he died for, that it's authentic and true. It says time and time again that God resurrected him from the dead so that you would have hope. So that you would be able to look upon Jesus and say, this life is not what it's all about. The stuff that I'm facing today, it is not bigger than Jesus is. He has solved it for eternity. Some of us come into this room and we are hopeless. Hopeless because of financial debt, moral debt, psychologically just battered, our marriage is in ruin, and Jesus says, I have come to give you life. I have come so that, and my yoke is not heavy. It's not, I'm not, I'm not going to weigh you down with some backpack of duty. I took care of it all. Come to me. 
Jesus says, and I will give you water to drink and bread to eat and life to be lived. And not just this one, but a life that is eternal. First Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Now that you've heard a bit of the background. By the way, I could teach on this for about six months. That's how long it would take us to get through all of the details of the background. For real. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. That's not just me, too, because I talk a lot. Uh, that's, that it would take us a long time. Like, there were a lot of things that were required. So I, I just to summarize those, I, 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 feel like I'm, I feel like I'm not giving you the whole picture, to be honest. I'm just trying to give you the parts that, that are essential. But you can understand why Peter, Peter, the disciple that just, he, he's the most like us, right? He just, he, he opens his mouth too much. He screws up too much. He's constantly missing the point. He's, he's, he wants to build altars when it's not necessary. He wants to tell Jesus, you know, I got this when he just should shut up and stand back. And that Peter, talk about a life transformed, a guy that denies Jesus three times who looks across the courtyard at a beaten and mauled Jesus and makes eye contact with him and turns his back and walks away. I get that. I get that kind of thing. I've certainly done that. That Peter writes this to the church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you hear that? That is outrageous. What an incredibly compact set of ideas. He's caused us to be born again, and it brings us into a living hope that we can have, and it comes because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And here it is. Here's your hope, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power... You, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made known or made manifest in these last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. Why? Why do it? So that your faith and hope are in God. It says that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can have confidence that you also, even if you suffer death here, you will rise again to a relationship with God forever and ever. It is captured well in 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let me pause. And just remind you, some of you have got a lot of old going on in your life. And you got dragged here on Easter Sunday morning because you wanted to be with your family. And now you're feeling all guilty and convicted about your sin and about the world and about what you are obsessed with, what drives you in this life, what you fantasize about, what you think about, what your heart runs after. If anyone, you included, are in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone. It is dead. It is on the cross. It has been sacrificed for. It's been covered by the blood of Jesus. And he's shown us from the very beginning what that means. It means forgiveness once and for all. All of this, verse 18, is from God. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself and has also given us the ministry of reconciliation. Jumping down to verse 21, it says that God, for our sake, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him 
we might become the righteousness of God. He does not just forgive you for your sins and leave you as not guilty as though you were accused of something in an American court and you went to court and they declared you not guilty. It says that he does not just wipe away your sin. He gives you the righteousness, the perfection, the the wonder of holiness that belongs to Jesus and he gives it to you. Not by any work that you have done, but purely because he knows you need it. Because having a relationship with God, that's worth it. And God knew it. And rather than make mankind work to get to God, God worked to get to man and did so through Jesus and holds your hand and the hand of God and like the perfect high priest brings you together with him. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm going to start a new series in the book of John and this is one of the first verses that's in the book of John. John chapter 1 verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Have you trusted your life to Jesus? It's Easter. It's a celebration of hope. It's a celebration that just is explosive, that that causes us to cry out, blessed be the name of the Lord. But I have to ask you, have you received him? Have you trusted him? Is he in you? Do you know him? Has he got a hold of your life? Have you trusted your entire life to the completely sufficient, the perfect provision of Jesus? The Bible says God does not give salvation to the self-sufficient. Isn't that wild? I could talk so much, but it's, it's getting to that time, so I won't. Salvation is for those who deny themselves, who, who come stripped of all the fancy things that they have to offer. And they respond in humility to God's great mercy and love. He has actively, passionately, sacrificially expressed this love to you. How will you respond? on this Easter morning. Giving your life to Christ is not a big, dramatic, whoop de dee moment. It is simply, even in the response time that we have when the worship team comes up, even as we close the service this morning and, and send us all out to Easter festivities, it's, it's, it doesn't need to be something that is over the top. It is simply in your heart, talking to God and asking him to wipe away your sin and I'm going to trust in the life of Jesus instead of the life that I've been living. I want his life for my life. And that will transform you. That will set you into a place that is going to change everything. Don't miss this because we're going to talk about it when we hit the book of John next week. We, we, we are going to get into this and we're going to just enjoy the wonder of having a relationship with Jesus and the life that it brings and the goodness that it offers and the hope that it pours into our lives. And it all starts with how are you going to respond on this Easter Sunday morning to the sacrifice of Jesus for you. He loves you. And I just want to encourage you, respond. Respond to him. Speak to him. Talk to him. You will find that he is merciful and that he is loving and that he wants what is greatest in your life. Let's pray as the worship team comes. God, I pray that those 
Father, that are here right now that have never trusted in you. Those that maybe said a prayer as a child but know in their hearts that it, it just, they've just never trusted in your sacrifice, trusted in your righteousness, trusted in your life for theirs. And God, even for those that are experienced and just find their spiritual life has just ground into dust. I pray that you would bring renewal, regeneration, that God, you would bring life to those things that are dead, that you would raise from the ground, Father, people that believe in you and will will get to celebrate in the relationship that they have with you. God, I pray that every one of us would be renewed in hope, that we'd be renewed in trusting you, that it would fire up our faith, and that, God, we would be, uh, we just come to you and celebrate in all that you have done. We don't deserve it, but we are so grateful for it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for Jesus. And thank you for such a sacrifice as he made on my behalf and on our behalf. Amen. Let's stand and respond on this Easter morning. I love you, Lord. For oh, your mercy never fails me. And all the days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I have made. Oh, I
Amen. Thank you, worship team. You can have a seat. Good morning. My name is Megan. I'm the children's ministry director here. Um, and if you are visiting or are new here and have kids, I would love to talk to you after church. So just come and find me. Um, we have announcements in your worship guide. All of the details are there, but a few things I want to highlight. We have a couple workshops coming up. The Four Freedom Workshop on April 27th. Um, it is something that will help you be equipped to minister and help people that deal with sexual addiction. Um, so if you might know people in your lives or just want to be prepared um, for people in your lives that might have those um, issues, it's a great time to get trained up on how to handle that. Um, Sam and Deborah Eberhart, um, their numbers are in the worship guide and would be happy to answer any questions you might have. You need to sign up for that. Tickets are $20. And then that same week, a few days before, we have a workshop for parents or caregivers. It's called How to Create a Tech-Ready Home. And that is put on by a company called Protect Young Eyes and is really um, something that is a great thing for all parents or caregivers to be a part of. That is free. It does require registration online. Just scan the QR codes um, or call me. My number is in the worship guide, too, and I can help you and answer any questions. Um, another great event for families is our beach cleanup that's coming up Saturday, April 13th. The men's ministry puts that on, but it's for the whole family or singles, whoever, anyone can come to that. VBS registration is open, um, if you guys see that in your worship guide. So that's for volunteers, for kids, the space is limited. Um, I already got like six or seven registrations yesterday after the Easter egg hunt. So um, I'm excited for VBS this year. If you want to be a part of that, see that in your worship guide. And um, I'm the person to, an to answer any questions you might have. Lastly, we have a few fundraisers going on. Um, if you guys saw the envelope board in the back to help send the kids to camp. And then we also have um, a dirt bag, the Cal State Long Beach baseball game, which is a fundraiser for our kids, but also just a great time to bring your friends and family and fellowship together with our community. So I hope you guys will be a part of some of those things. Um, it's just a great we have a great family here, and we want to support our kids. We want to support parents. We want to um, be available to those that are struggling. So there's a lot of opportunities to be a part of that here at Long Beach Alliance. If you'll stand, I have a blessing for you from Romans 8 as we leave. Um, just something for you to think about from Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through God who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Happy Easter. Have a great Sunday. Praise God. 